Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're still in Matthew chapter 24. We are dealing with the time of great tribulation. In fact, Jesus called it the days of tribulation. And we'll look at our beginning verses here in a minute in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus used that word tribulation twice in that verse. But let me read uh, a verse from the last watchman that we did to sort of describe a little bit of what I've been going through since our last watchman broadcast. It comes from John chapter 16. And John, uh, in, in John 16, Jesus described how uh, there will be times that will feel like a woman when she is in travail, time of great sorrow. And of course, I'm not a woman, never pretended to be. There are no pictures of me on the internet in a dress anywhere. So I can't imagine how a woman feels when she is in her time of birthing, when the waters break forth and so on. But Jesus said that there it is a time of great sorrow. It's a time of a lot of pain, a, a lot of going through very, very difficult times. And here's what Jesus said after that in John chapter 16, verse 32. He said, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that, shall, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. And let me stop right here. I think he tells us this so that at times when we feel like we are all alone, we know that we're not. Even though we look around and we don't see anybody that we know or anybody that knows us or anybody that even would like us, and we feel alone, we're never alone. Jesus promised. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I promise you, I will not do that. As long as we have his word, either here in the book or especially in our heart, he's always with us. And in that, the Father will always be with us, no matter what. Then he said, these things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, since the last broadcast, I've found out that one of my very, very young granddaughters possibly diagnosed with cerebral palsy. And that hurt me. I mean, the moment that I heard about it, I started weeping. Those of you who know me, you know that my family is very, very, very precious to me. My wife, my daughters, my sons, and all of my grandchildren, including the one that's in heaven now. That in itself, going through that was a time of great tribulation for me. It was. It's very troubling. Then the process of this beautiful baby that we have, grandchild, she smiles every time she looks at me. I don't, have an, I don't have another grandchild that smiles when they look at me, unless I got a piece of candy in my hand. But she smiles when she sees me. Big, big smile, beautiful smile. And I just have been weeping for her, praying. God would either heal her, which I'm okay with, or that God would give her and our family grace which I am also okay with. You see, I, I don't always trust healing because the body will still die even after you're healed. We're all still going to die. But I always trust grace. Always. Grace truly is always sufficient. So during that time, dealing with that issue, then, of course, that same grandchild's father now has been tested positive for COVID. So that whole family's been quarantined. We've tried to make sure that it has not affected anybody in our church again. And that, of course, brings back thoughts of back in September of 2020, when a great portion of our church had COVID, including myself. One man died. One man almost died. 
And I can remember being the absolute most sick, ill that I've ever been in my life. And it's just brought a lot of trouble to my mind and to my heart. God's brought us through it. We still have some things to go through, but God has brought us through it. So yes, in this, wor in this world, and, and if anybody tells you, well, that's Jesus, that's not for us, that Jesus' teachings in the four Gospels are not for us, well, that's not what Paul said. Paul said that we are to listen and adhere to the teachings and the doctrines and the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm listening to him today, okay? And in this world, I have trouble. But in Christ, I have peace and joy. And he says, I have overcome the world. And isn't that interesting that he said that even before his death, burial, and resurrection, he knew he had already overcome the world. And there was peace in his heart. Now, Matthew chapter 24, verse 21 is the first place we find it. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, and except, and here's why I say it's the days of tribulation, not years, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And he refers to a time in the future, not in the past, but in the future, for then shall be days of great tribulation, a period that right now, I don't know how long it's going to last. I have no idea. It's like asking a brain surgeon, uh, yes, you're going to take this major tumor out of somebody I know. Can you tell me about what time you're going to be done? Because I have a golf game this afternoon. The doctor has no idea, okay? We don't have any idea right now. Uh, and it's not, and it, the times that are coming, this world has never seen anything like it before. Now, I do believe in typology. I believe that there are types and shadows all through the scripture that point to those days that give us a glimpse sort of what those days are going to be like. But the, the scale of which the tribulation and the things that are going to occur are going to happen, the like of which is never seen before. You know, maybe in, in one place, you know, maybe last week in, in some place in the world, a great earthquake struck. Well, that really didn't affect the rest of the world. What I believe is going to happen is going to happen to the entire world simultaneously so that if one country has a problem, they won't be able to go to the other countries and say, hey, we need help here. Can you help us with our problems? The other countries are going, hey, we need help here. Can you help us with our problems? That's how bad it's going to be. There isn't going to be any earthly help for anybody. It'll be a time where people will have to trust in the Lord. Then he says in Matthew 24, verse 29, he gives us a clue now of what, what is it that marks the end of the days of that tribulation. It is this event. And we covered this in the last Watchman because we said if this event, according to Jesus, is the one that ends the tribulation, it cannot be related to Revelation 19 where Jesus returns to fight the battle of Armageddon. It cannot be because in that day there is no mention of the sun being darkened, the moon turned to blood, and the stars of heaven either withdrawing their shining or falling down to, or a third of them falling down to the earth. That occurs in Genesis 6 at the opening of the sixth seal, not at Genesis, or excuse me, Revelation, uh, what is it? Revelation 18, I think at the opening 
or Revelation 16, 17, 18, beginning in 19, at the opening of the seventh vial, there is, during the vile judgments, no mention of the sun being darkened, the moon turning to blood, the stars withdrawing their shining, and a third of the stars being cast into the earth. Not one mention of that during that time. And that, according to the pre-tribulational, premillennialists, is the end of the quote-unquote seven-year tribulation. So it, they don't, it's, this is a square peg and this is a round hole. And they don't, they don't go together the way I see it. Here's what he says. Matthew 24, verse 29 and 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Coming in the clouds of heaven is a very, and we'll dedicate some time to this, a very important issue. The Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, to further prove my point, that what he's talking about here is not the end of the seven vials of wrath, we notice that the sign of Jesus coming is that he's coming in the clouds. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Well, in Revelation 19, when Jesus is coming at the Battle of Armageddon his, to establish his thousand-year reign, it begins in verse 11 with saying, I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. That's Jesus. So here in Matthew 24, at the end of the tribulation of those days, it's a day of clouds, and Jesus appears in those clouds. And I'm going to do, uh, I've done this before, and I'll do it again, another series on the symbolism of the clouds, what they mean. Remember what God said in Genesis 9, when I bring a cloud over the land, that my bow shall be seen in the cloud. And his bow is Jesus. Here, it's not cloudy. I saw heaven opened. Jesus is not coming in clouds in Revelation 19.11. There are no clouds here. So, years ago, as I told God, God, I'll throw everything out. You put it back in. I noticed that. And I'm going, it's supposed to be clouds here in Matthew 24, 29 and 30. There's supposed to be clouds, but here the clouds are all gone because heaven now has been opened up. It just didn't match the things that I was taught and the things that I at one time believed and the things that I at one time taught others. I was in error. I made mistakes. So now I'm trying to correct them. So what we've been doing, we have been, of course, going through the entire Bible, looking at all the words tribulation or tribulations. We've looked in the Old Testament. We've looked at all the occurrences in the four Gospels, uh, one of which was the parable of the seed and the sower, when the seed falls on stony ground and when tribulation or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, for the word's sake, these people are offended and because they have no root, they die off. And I've known people, I have known people personally that have lived that in their lives, pretending to be saved, receiving the word one day, and yet then they find out that there's something in the Bible that offends them or something in the Bible that they just absolutely refuse to believe. And then they shut the book and they say, I'm not, I'm not going for this. I'm not buying this. And they walk away. Tribulation or persecution arose for the word's sake. And because they had no root, 
they're gone. So those are the four Gospels. Those are the Old Testament occurrences that we looked at. Now we'll look at it in the book of Acts. Let's see what, let's see what the early church taught. You know, everybody says, you know, we need to get back to the original church. The original church did it this way. The original church was like this. So let's look at what the early church believed and said according to not letters outside of the Bible, but according to the Bible itself. Acts chapter 14, verse 19. There came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Stop. Ugh. They pelted him with stones so bad, they literally drug his body outside of the city, thinking that they were dragging a dead body, and they're going to toss him outside the city and lock the gates. Just let him lay out there and let the ravens have him. Paul wasn't dead. In fact... See, I just, I don't know. I'm not Paul. You, you just hit me one time with stones. I'm going to lay there and act, I'm going to act dead for the rest of my life. Okay? Paul, Paul got up. Look at this. Verse 20. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up <laughs> and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Paul, you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Shake it off. Let's go. Let's go preach. Whew. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the soul. Look at what he said now. Look at what they preached in the early church. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, not works, the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Now, here's why I said through faith, is that I'll just say hyper-dispensationalism. I won't accuse certain of my dispensationalist friends of believing this. I'll say hyper-dispensationalists believe that during the time of, the, of what they call the seven-year tribulation, which, again, the reason why we're looking at all the words tribulation in the Bible is that we're going to find out the Bible never says seven-year tribulation or tribulation of seven years or during the tribulation of those seven years. We'll never find anything like that. We're not even going to find seven years and the word tribulation in the same verse together. It's not there. But anyway, our hyper-dispensationalist friends don't believe that during the seven-year tribulation that people are saved by grace through faith. They don't believe that. They believe that there is another gospel given to them. Remember what dispensational truth means. Clarence Larkin's book, Dispensational Truth. The phrase itself means there is a different truth during each dispensation. A truth that is true during that dispensation, but wasn't necessarily true during a former or a, or a um, coming dispensation. It's a different gospel during each dispensation. That's what our hyper-dispensationalist people believe. So here is Paul telling them to continue. He's just been beaten up to death, almost. And he got up, put his coat on, and said, boys, let's go preach. I'm like, get me to a hospital, and I'm going to milk this for all it's worth. Okay? Not Paul. <whistles> that they continue in the faith, and that we must, we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. And how did Paul know that? Paul could say, yeah, I just got stoned. Where were they? Uh, in Iconium. That's where they were when they, apparently, when Paul, when Paul got stoned, Paul just said, I was at Iconium two days ago. They stoned me so bad, they drug my body outside. They thought I was dead. 
God healed me, lifted me up, and here I am telling you we're preaching today. I still remember how a stone feels when it comes across the side of your face, and boy, does it hurt. And these things we will have to go. He's not preaching Joel Osteen's message, people. The Apostle Paul, I'll say it, the Apostle Paul would hate Joel Osteen, hate him, and call him a false prophet to his face. Because Joel Osteen will never preach such a negative sermon to you or anybody else, or even on his Joel Osteen Inspiration Cube for your love gift of $19,000. He will never say that because it's a negative confession. And if you say that you got stoned two days ago, you are saying to the universe, stone me again. That's what he believes. I'm not, I'm not making this up. It's called the law of attraction. Study that. If you don't mind studying occult things, most of you, I would tell you, stay away from it. But it's called the law of attraction. But anyway, Paul said it. Paul said that we, we, and even the, even the dispensationalists, hyper-dispensationalists say that only the doctrine of Paul we believe. Well, here is the doctrine of Paul. It's coming out of his mouth. We, that we are to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. It's going to happen. We're going to have tribulation here. I've had it several times myself. You're going to have it. You've already had it several times. And I believe that we will go through a period. I do not know how long it lasts. It is days of tribulation. We will go through that, and at the end of that, we're going to be able to lift up our heads, for our redemption draweth nigh. That's what I believe. Romans 5 now. So this is pure for those hyper-dispensationalists say, we only believe what Paul said. Then try believing this one. Romans 5, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Remember, it's all about us standing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood. Paul says, by, by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Paul says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Ephesians 6, having done all to stand, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. It's all about standing while everybody else falls. And that time when, when the tribulation days are over and the sun and the moon are the darkened and the heavens and the earth are shaken, the apostle Paul tells us the shaking is to cause everything that cannot stand to fall. Angels are going to fall out of heaven, and people on this earth who seem upright are going to fall. Church members are going to fall. So he says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Now watch this. We glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. I'll do this. Patience experience, and experience hope. Hope maketh not ashamed. It's five things here. First Thessalonians 4, there are five things there. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. First Corinthians 15, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. How many sons of the prophets saw Elijah raptured? Fifty. 
what chapter of the Bible was Elisha caught up into heaven? What verse in Hebrews 11 did it say that Elijah was translated? See, five is the number for the translation. It starts out representing death, but then it ends up being resurrection over death. And there are five things here that tribulation does. We glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, experience hope, hope maketh not ashamed. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So, I couldn't, I couldn't just build a whole doctrine out of this little number thing that I did, but it matches the whole meaning of the number five. It matches it. And I've learned that God does not ever speak out of order. Romans chapter 8. Again, this is Paul's doctrine. This is what Paul is teaching. Not Peter, not James, not John for the hyper-dispensationalist. This is what the apostle Paul said. Romans 8, verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now, he's going to use the word tribulation here. There's a list here. And we're going to, you know me, if I see a list, like we saw in the previous verse, tribulations, patience, experience, hope, not ashamed, five things. So we're going to see another list here in Romans chapter 8, okay? And they're going to go through and look at that number. It's a different number. And I'm going to show you how it's related to the translation. Watch this. What shall then we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And I want you to think of this now. If, if I'm even close to being right, and we go through rough seas before we get to heaven. Yes, many of our forefathers did. What can we expect while we're in those rough seas? What can we expect during times of tribulation? Here's what he said. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Now, let me stop right here. Remember that the rapture, the translation, is also the first what? resurrection. The second resurrection is for those who are damned and they receive a new eternal body that will burn forever. We receive a new body that won't burn forever, that will enjoy happiness forever. Amen to that one. Okay? So that's what the resurrection and the rapture, the translation, is all about. It's out about us being resurrected. And, and he says here, uh, Who is he that condemneth it is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again? He's telling us that. Who's even at the right hand of God? He's telling us that because that's what our translation is about. It's about the resurrection. The dead in Christ shall rise first, not with the same old zombie body, but with a new body. And then those who are alive and remain at that time will be caught up and then instantly translated into that new body without, it, without our old body seeing death. That's what it's all about. So now watch what he says. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation. Stop right here. First thing out of his mouth. First word out of Paul's mouth. And if you think that these are just Paul's guessings, no, these the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God gave Paul the very first word to write down. Tribulation, Paul. Who shall separate us? 
from the love of Christ shall tribulation while you're going in through deep tribulation when my wife you know we're uh, we're the modern generation the old time generation the men sat out in the waiting room while the woman gave birth i'm the generation who got to go into the labor and delivery room and while my wife is delivering child i'm holding her hand telling her honey i love you honey i love you honey it's going to be okay i know it hurts honey even though she's not listening much to me, I'm still telling her, I'm with her. Honey, I love you. Nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So tribulation, no. Distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. And he's going to pause the list. So right now we have tribulation, distress, two, persecution, three, famine, Four, nakedness, five, peril, six, sword, seven. So we have seven things already. Then verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. And you know what I've heard from people who, who do not like me, do not like what I say about the translation and this thing about tribulation? What? You think Jesus is going to drag his bride through the mud before he marries her? Now, to be honest with you, that's a, a ridiculous statement. Ridiculous. Yes, we are accounted as the bride of Christ, but we're also counted as other things. His body, as the bride is, so are we his bride and his body. And as Christ suffered, so must we also suffer. Make sense? For thy sake we are killed all the day long. Our forefathers in the faith, going back through the Dark Ages, through the Catholic Inquisitions, were burned at the stake, suffered horrendous, horrendous, terrible, persecution, suffering at the hands of evil priests, trying to make them confess that the Pope is God on earth, and they wouldn't do it, till finally their body gave out and they died. For thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter, nay, and all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither, here's another list now, the second list, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what I did was, I made it easy for you. I listed those lists and numbered them. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, that's number one, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, that's seven. Verse 38, from persuaded that neither death, eight, life, angels, principalities, powers. Remember, we wrestle against principalities and powers, don't we? Do they cause us trouble? Do they persecute us? Do they make us go through tribulation? Yes. Things present, things to come, height, depth, nor any other creature. 17. There's exactly 17 things here that cannot, sh that shall not be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So no matter what we go through, no matter what we endure, there may be a few people who go through all 17 of these, all, just one of them. I look at just one of them and going, I don't want to do this. 
I could tell you stories of how big a wimp I am. Huge, huge wimp. I won't, because it's embarrassing. But I ran away from every fight that my mouth got me into. Okay? I look at this list here, and I'm going, I don't want to go through any of these. None of them. And then it says, verse in the 17th thing is any other creature. What in the world is that? Well, you know me, I have a theory. Okay? And I've talked about it several times. 17 things here. What is the number 17 for? Let's go to the 17th chapter of the Bible. Let's do what I did years ago when I came across the number 17 and I wanted to know what the number 17 was. Why was it so significant? So I looked in Genesis 17. Here's what I found. Genesis 17 verse 5. Remember the five things we saw earlier? Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Now, what did God do here? In fact, let me, let's do this. Let me show you something. The first time God ever speaks to Moses is in, of course, I'll never be able to find it in a quick way, is in Genesis chapter 12. First time he ever speaks. Now you do the math here. Genesis 12, now the Lord said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country from the, and he said, uh, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse, curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Very first time God speaks to Abram. Genesis, seven, Genesis 12 to Genesis 17. How many chapters is that? Five chapters later, he's changing him from Abram to Abraham. Five chapters after that would be 17 to 20 is 3, plus 2 more would be Genesis 22. In Genesis 22, he's taking his son, his only begotten son, to Mount Moriah where Jesus died to offer him up. And we know what the scriptures say that compelled Abraham to go to Mount Moriah to kill his son. Abraham thought he was, Abraham thought he was supposed to kill his son, but that's not what God said. God just said offer him. But Abraham thought kill. And we know that the Bible says that Abraham was thinking, even if I kill him, God's going to do what? What's God going to do with him? resurrecting. That's what the rapture is. You see how this Bible's in order? From Genesis 12, the first time he calls him Abram, now five chapters later, he's calling him Abraham. And how does he, how does he change his name from Abram to Abraham? He adds a letter, a Hebrew letter. It's the letter Hey. And if you look in Psalm 119, it'll list the Hebrew letters for you. And He is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Pretty cool, isn't it? Oh, and then verse 15. He did it in verse 5 of Genesis 17. Genesis 17, verse 15, which is three times five. God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, Thou shalt not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. Added the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, hey. And hey has breath in it, the spirit. Do you get that? In Matthew, the 17th, this is the 17th chapter of the Old Testament, Genesis 17. The 17th chapter of the New Testament is Matthew 17. See how easy that is? And it says, after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, 
and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Jesus was changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, just like we're going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's in the 17. So 17 is a number for transformation. Watch this. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Speaking of transformations, right? Transformations is God saying to Israel, I'm done with you. I'm going to find me a people who are Gentiles, who are not Jews. They'll listen to every word I say. Even if you don't, they will. So on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse, starting in verse 7, I listed the number of languages that the Bible records the disciples spake on the day of, what, what day was Pentecost? 50th. You see how many times this number 5 and this number 17 have joined together? And we're not done. And, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how we hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Starting with, in verse 9, number 1, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt, in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians, number 17, do we hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God? Drop my hat. Exactly 17 things. And they heard a rushing mighty wind. See, the day of Pentecost is a fore foreshadowing of the rapture, the translation, the change. When God is going to restore a pure language, now, 1 Thessalonians 4 is our doctrine on the, on the rapture, right? It's, if you're looking, I can you know, show you typology of the rapture, but if we're looking for doctrine of the rapture, we go to the first place everybody goes to, 1 Thessalonians 4, because there I'm just listed in no uncertain terms, this is what's going to happen, this is how it's going to happen. So 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. And here's, here's another place where the 5 and the 17 just sort of meet. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now look at verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's in verse 17. And it's the fifth thing that happens. You see, why didn't God put all of that in verse 16? Because he cut the list, cut off part of the list and added it to the next verse. The, even, the sentence wasn't even done. God has a reason for everything that he does. And that reason, once you understand, it just matches up perfectly. So, 17, which is a prime number, but if you multiply 17 times 3, you get 50, see, 17 times 2 would be 34. 17 times 3 would be 51. So can you think of another verse in the Bible that speaks of the rapture? That would be verse 51. Ah, 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's verse 51. We shall not all, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. 
I mean, we, folks, it's there. Okay? It's there. That's what the number 17 represents. And here's Paul telling us that even in tribulation, that cannot separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Cannot, cannot separate us from that. We have a few more verses to deal with tribulation in the scriptures. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of, you see, transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And in verse 12 of the same chapter, he says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. This is Paul telling us to be patient, which is what he said earlier about tribulation bringeth patience. Patience in tribulation. Don't ask to be taken out of that trying time. Ask God for you to be patient while he works his good work in you. Stop and think about all the bad times that you've been through. I've been through them. Oh, horrible times. But I look and see what God did to me and with me during those times. And brother, I wouldn't change those for anything. Because I'm a much, much different person now than I ever used to be. I wouldn't change them for anything. Because I know what God did for me. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 3, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Comfort is a Holy Ghost word. It's a Bible word. Who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Now, you see here, this is where, and I mentioned this earlier, this is where he links the word trouble with tribulation. Notice what he says. He comforted us in all our tribulation, all of them, no matter what tribulation any saint goes through, the comforter is going to be there. And see, we're told, we're told that at the rapture, in the beginning of the seven-year tribulation, the Holy Ghost is taken off the earth. And yet we're told here that God comforts us in our tribulation. Do those two phrases match up? Do those two ideas match up? No. They're different. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And again, our hyper-dispensationalist people say that during the tribulation, no one is saved by grace through faith. And yet here, it is because of our suffering that people are comforted and consoled and saved. It doesn't match. They don't, they don't add up. They don't match up. They do not, can two walk together except they be agreed. And these two ideas do not agree with each other. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 1, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Again, this is the doctrine of Paul. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. 
I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled, here it is, with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled. There it is, and there's another one again. We were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. See, I, I take comfort in knowing that I'm not the only one who gets troubled so much that I can't preach sometimes. Sometimes when I can't get a watchman out, it's because I'm, I'm troubled. Sometimes when I can't do a Pastor Mike Online live broadcast, there's been a couple times when I started to do the broadcast and as soon as I started talking, the anxiety hit me and I had to cut the feed because it just takes, all, it takes over your mind and you can't even talk. And it's, so it's sort of hard to just, you know, have the camera staring at you and everybody's looking at you while you're going. It's kind of embarrassing. Paul been troubled on every side before too. Without were fightings and within were fears. I'm glad I'm not the only one that's ever had to go through that. But I wouldn't wish it on anybody else. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, to the intent now, that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Let me stop right here and explain this. Do you know there are devils who actually stand in the presence of God who do not know what we know? They, they have no idea. Had, had Satan known that in possessing Judas to cause him to sell out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, that that would spell out Satan's own destruction. Satan would have never, the Bible tells us this, he would have never entered into Judas. He would have never done it. There are things that principalities and powers, that devils who stand in the presence of God, there are things that they don't know that we know. I like that. I, I've got just a little bit of arrogance in me that makes me like that, especially when it comes to the devils, because I don't, I'm not instructed in any way to love devils. I hate them. I hate them. I hate the devil. I hate everything he does, everything he's done to me, everything he's done to my family. I hate him. I hate them all. And I'm glad that I know something that he doesn't know. To the intent that now under principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he hath purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the, watch this now, breadth, length, depth, height. And that's what got me on studying the number four and what it meant. And it does, the number four doesn't relate to anything down here. It's always in the spiritual realm, relates to the gospel, the false gospel, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness, high places, the fourth kingdom, and how the four gospels and their story, Jesus Christ, the living Son of God, is going to conquer all four of those kingdoms. That's what started it with me. And it came as a result, my studying that, and God bringing me to study everything I've studied came about as a, from a time of horrible, 
tribulation. A time in my life that for years after that, I had bad dreams about. That's how much they were in my mind. 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Afflictions. We are appointed to afflictions. And then people ask me, well, you believe Jesus drags his bride through the mud? Well, I'm reading Paul right here. And Paul said that because we follow Christ, we will be afflicted. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily when we were with you, we told you that before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass. And you know, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. We, we, Paul said, and who, according, let's say I'm a dispensationalist, and I only believe what Paul said. Paul said that we should suffer tribulation. So I have to believe Paul. We should suffer tribulation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that our faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. He links persecution and tribulation which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. How? That you endure persecution and tribulation. What was it Paul said in the book of Acts? That we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Here he's saying the same thing for which he also suffer. Verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Hello, that's Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall uh, see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Here he said, he said it here in Matthew 24, and here he says, to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Same thing, same thing. Same event. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. And we are the saints. Oh, yes, we are. Look it up. Okay, look up the word saint or saints in the King James Bible. Just look at that word and see who the Bible calls saints. Okay? Now, just a couple of last verses found in the book of Revelation. Two places, and only two places, where the word tribulation is mentioned. First, Revelation 2. This, uh, I think, I think, I may be wrong, that some uh, dispensationalists also believe that the seven churches represent seven church ages. Maybe. 
But I see the writings to the seven churches no different than I see Paul writing to the church of Corinth, to the churches of Galatia, to the church at Ephesus, to Timothy, to Philemon, to the church at Philippi, to the church of Rome. I see no difference. I see the doctrines that Jesus teaches each one of those seven churches valid for all the churches at all times. It would be like saying, well, what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church is only for the Corinthian church. It's not for the Galatian churches, and it's not for the church at Philippi. The church at Philippi should not read nor believe for doctrine any of the doctrines that Paul laid out in First and Second Corinthians. It would be like saying that, and I don't believe that. I believe what Jesus said to one, he said to all. So here's what he said. Revelation 2.8, Unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, literally, literally, the devil cast some of the people from the church in Smyrna into prison for ten days, and they suffered tribulation, and some of them died. And Jesus told them, if you die continuing in the faith, I'll give you a crown of life. And brothers, continuing in faith is not works. It's faith. I still believe. I still believe every word in this book is right. No matter what I've been through, no matter what I've gone through, no matter how angry at God I've been at times in my past, I still believe every word, every word that he says in this book, every one of them. There is no mistake in my Bible. And if these saints can hang on for 10 days, may God grant us the grace to endure tribulation for at least 10 days. Now, I'm not saying that's how long it's going to last. I don't know. But what he says to one church, he says to all, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Some of us will go to prison. Some of us will die for the faith. Will you? Would you be willing to? You're going to die anyway. And you really don't get a choice of whether your death is going to be painful or you're just going to die in your sleep. You have no idea. You could have a stroke and just be dead and not even know that you died until you're standing before God. Or you could die in such agony. Nobody has control over that. You're going to die anyway. I'd rather die serving the Lord than for any other reason I can think of. Jesus knows our tribulation, my friends. Last place, last place. And this, to me, this nails it. In Revelation 7, and turn your Bible there, there are clearly two groups delineated. Now, the Dispensationalists believe that there is a difference between the Jew and the church. I can see that to some extent. Clearly, during this time, 
the Jews are going to be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. They're going to be sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And at that point, they're going to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They're, and they're going to follow Jesus and God's going to seal them. God's, this is the remnant that he's talked about. This is the 7,000 that he told Elijah he had reserved. Okay, And there's other illustrations all throughout the Bible how God has reserved back for him Jews who have not served Satan, they're true to, to God, and God is going to reveal to them the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and they're going to believe in him. The veil is going to be lifted. It's not going to be Moses under there. It's going to be Jesus, and they're going to believe it. So God is going to seal the Jews in Revelation chapter 7. Then there's another group in Revelation 7, starting in verse 9. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues. So this is not the Jews. This is not Zebulun. This is not Gad. This is not Naphtali. This is not Judah. This is not Levi. This is all the other tribes and the families and kindreds, nations. This is all the Gentile, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight, people. All of them stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. There's a lot of symbolism here. I won't get into it. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing, and there's seven things here, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever, amen. One of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they? And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. That would be me, like, why are you asking me? You're, you're an angel. Don't you know? Surely you know, right? And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. People, that's salvation through grace, through faith. The blood of the Lamb the white blood cells washing up all the uncleanness in our robes. We believed in the Son of God, and therefore our robes are washed white and clean. Whew. And made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 15, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb of God, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and he shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. See, I've been through tribulation where I cried and cried and cried until God wiped the tears from my eyes and said, Mike, it's okay. I've been through that already. So I know a little bit about what it's like. I believe there's another one coming, a great one. I don't know how bad it's going to be. I think it's going to be really bad. And it makes me a little bit afraid. But you know what? I know that at the end of that, no matter how long it lasts, could be like the days of Noah. But however long it lasts, I know that God's going to hang on to me. Because I'm not hanging on to him. He's holding me. 
He's elected me. And I know at the end, God's going to wipe away all the tears from my eyes. He stored every one of them in a bottle, the Bible says. He's going to keep me. And I'm going to get to be around his throne forever and forever and forever. So now, back in Matthew 24, I'm, I'm, and I'm just going to show you where we're going to go from there. And what I've done is I've literally showed you almost every place in the Bible where the word tribulation or tribulations is used. Now, do your own study if you think I've hid one of the places where it says seven-year tribulation, because I promise you I haven't. And I've not found a seven-year tribulation. I've not found it anywhere. In any of these verses did I ever find it. And I especially didn't find the place where it said, we do not go through tribulation. I did not find that verse. I found in every, almost literally in every verse where it said tribulation, that yes, we will go through it. Not one, not one of these verses with tribulation in it did we ever see where we're not going through it. So that doesn't match. It simply doesn't make sense to me. So then what we're, what we're going to next is the event. I call it the event. At the end of that tribulation of those days, the sun is dark and the moon turned to blood. The stars of heaven shall fall. We're going to look at that event. We're going to see, according to the Bible, what's going to happen in that day and what it's related to. Okay? Now again, you may not agree with one thing that I said during this whole series on tribulation. But my challenge to you is go to the scriptures and send me two or three witnesses from the word of God that anything that I said in this is wrong. I'll read the comments on the YouTube videos. And I have been. And I appreciate those of you who have come out in support of this saying, Pastor, we, we just, we didn't know how to put it together. But we agree. Now, you may not agree with everything that I say. But a lot of people are just waking up who haven't read Clarence Larkin because God never told them to. And they're just reading the scriptures and they're not finding anywhere of a seven-year tribulation. They're not finding it. So if you can't find it in the scripture, then where did it come from? And again, if you can prove me wrong that I can't find a seven-year tribulation, you put it in the comments of these, of these videos, because I'm going to read them. And if I read, and I read it clearly, that I was wrong, I will make the video and say, I was wrong. There it was in front of me, and I never saw it before. I don't know why I didn't see it, but there it was right in front of me. I never saw it before. I will make that video. I promise you that. Because i got to stand before God one of these days, give an account of everything I've preached to you, every sermon I preached, everything I said, I have to stand before God and, and give an account. And if I'm wrong, yeah. so let God be true, every man a liar. This is Pastor Mike. You're the reason why we do what we do. Pray for what our work in Kenya. We're continuing now. Michael's back from Kenya. We're continuing the work of feeding the hungry people in Turkana, preaching the gospel in Samburu and Turkana, Kenya, and other places. Pray for those ministries. 
pray for those ministries. Ask God, what can I, what can I do? Okay? God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.